Good day, history students. I am Mr. J. D. Los Santos. And for this video lecture, I will present a concluding note on the history of the United States of America from pre Columbian era to Reconstruction period. Before the lecture begins, ready yourself. Your pen and paper for note taking. Okay? Are you ready? If yes, then let's start. Beginning of the New World Ancient Americans shaped the history of human beings in the New World for more than 13,000 years. They established continuous human habitation in the Western Hemisphere. From the time the first big game hunters crossed Beringia until 1492 and beyond. But much can be pieced together from artifacts they left behind at camps, kill sites, and ceremonial and residential centers. Ancient Americans achieved their success through resourceful adaptation to the hemisphere's changing natural environments. They also adapted to social and cultural changes caused by human beings, such as marriages and deaths, as well as political struggles and warfare among chiefdoms. Their creativity and artistry are unmistakably documented in their numerous artifacts. When European intruders began arriving in the Western Hemisphere in 1492, they have coveted Native Americans' wealth, labor, and land. And Christian missionaries sought to save their souls. Likewise, Native Americans marveled at such European technological novelties as sailing ships, steel weapons, gunpowder, and horses. While often reserving judgment about Europeans' Christian religion. In the centuries following 1492, as the trickle of European strangers became a flood of newcomers from both Europe and Africa, the Native Americans and settlers continued to encounter one another. Peaceful negotiations as well as violent conflicts over both land and trading rights resulted in chronic fear and mistrust. Thus, the era of European colonization marked the beginning of the end of ancient America. The European colonization The 16th century in the New World belonged to the Spaniards who employed Columbus. Now look at the map. You can see the various sea explorations conducted by Portugal and later Spain. And from this, the Portuguese, whose voyages to Africa and Asia set the stage for Columbus's voyages, won the important consolation prize of Brazil. But Spain hit the jackpot. Isabella of Spain helped initiate the Colombian exchange between the New World and the Old, which massively benefited first Spain, and later followed by other European countries. The exchange also subjected Native Americans to the ravages of European diseases and Spanish conquest. Spanish explorers and colonists forced Indians to serve the interests of Spanish settlers and the Spanish monarchy. European sailing ships regularly bridged the Atlantic and carried people, products, diseases, and ideas from one shore to the other. Spain remained a new world power for almost four centuries and its language, religion, culture, and institutions left a permanent imprint. However, by the end of the 16th century, other European monarchies had begun to contest Spain's dominion in Europe and the New World. Most significant of all, would be England and France. England's rulers eyed the huge North American hinterland of New Spain. They realized that it lacked the two main attractions of Mexico and Peru the incredible material wealth, and the large populations of Indians to use as workers. With plentiful native labor in North America, England would need to find some way to attract colonizers to a region that, compared to New Spain, did not appear very promising. The 13 colonies. Look at the map, and familiarize the original 13 colonies. Take time to familiarize the 13 colonies of England. During the next century, England's leaders overcame these dilemmas by developing a distinctive colonial model. One that encouraged land-hungry settlers from England and Europe to engage in agriculture. And that depended on other sources of unfree labor, indentured servants from Europe and slaves from Africa. The Southern Colonies By 1700, the colonies of Virginia, Maryland, and Carolina were firmly established. 
The staple crops they grew for export provided a livelihood for many, a fortune for a few, and valuable revenues for shippers, merchants, and the English monarchy. Their societies differed markedly from English society. Yet the colonists considered themselves English people who happened to live in North America. They claimed the same rights and privileges as English men and women. While they denied those rights and privileges to Native Americans and African slaves. Few English missionaries sought to convert Indians to Protestant Christianity. Unlike the numerous Catholic missionaries in the Spanish settlements in New Mexico and Florida, large quantities of gold and silver never materialized in English North America. As a matter of fact, English colonists never adopted the system of encomienda, yet important forms of coerced labor and racial distinction developed. As English colonists employed servants and slaves, and defined themselves as superior to Indians and Africans. As English settlement pushed north, west, and south of Chesapeake Bay, the Indians faced the new colonial world that Powhatan and Pocahontas had encountered when John Smith and the first colonists had arrived at Jamestown. By 1700, the many descendants of Pocahontas's son, as well as other colonists and Native Americans, understood that the English had come to stay. Economically, the southern colonies developed during the 17th century from the struggling Jamestown settlement that could not feed itself into a major source of profits for England. The European fashion for tobacco provided livelihoods for numerous white families and riches for elite planters. But after 1700, enslaved Africans were conscripted in growing numbers to grow tobacco in the Chesapeake and rice in Carolina. Thus, the slave society dominated the southern colonies. A desire for land, a hope for profit, and a dream for security motivated southern white colonists. Realizing these aspirations involved great risks, considerable suffering, and frequent disappointment. As well as seizing Indian lands and coercing labor from servants and slaves. By 1700, despite huge disparities in individual colonists' success in achieving their goals, Tens of thousands of white colonists who were immigrants or descendants of immigrants now considered the southern colonies their home. The Northern Colonies By 1700, the northern colonies had developed quite different from the example set by their southern colonies. Unlike the scattered plantations and largely male environment of early Virginia, the emigrants came with their families and created settlements. Puritans in New England built towns and governments around their churches and placed worship of God, not tobacco, at the center of their society. They depended chiefly on the labor of family members rather than on that of servants and slaves. The convictions of Puritanism that motivated John Winthrop and others to reinvent England in the colonies became muted, however. As New England matured and dissenters such as Roger Williams multiplied. The northern colonists developed an ever-increasing need for land that inevitably led to bloody conflict with the Indians who were displaced. With this, the royal government in England intervened to try to moderate those conflicts and to govern the colonies more directly for the benefit of the monarchy. However, assertions of royal control triggered colonial resistance that was ultimately suppressed, resulting in Massachusetts losing its special charter status and becoming a royal colony much like the other British North American colonies. Colonial America in the 18th century The English colonial world would undergo surprising new developments. Immigrants from Scotland, Ireland, and Germany streamed into North America, and unprecedented numbers of African slaves poured into the southern colonies. On average, white colonists attained a relatively comfortable standard of living especially compared with most people in England and continental Europe. While religion remained important, the intensity of religious concern that characterized the 17th century waned during the 18th century. Colonists worried more about prosperity than about providence, and their societies grew increasingly secular, worldly, and diverse. Now, let's take a short break. Let's see if you have familiarized the 13 colonies. Are you ready? Identity the exact location of the 13 colonies. I will wait for your answers. Congratulations! You got the correct answers. 
Now, let's continue. In a nutshell, the southern colonies were established as economic ventures and were seeking natural resources to provide material wealth to the mother country and themselves. In contrast, the early New England colonists were primarily religious reformers and separatists. They were seeking a new way of life to glorify God and for the greater good of their spiritual life. On the other hand, the middle colonies welcomed people from various and diverse lifestyles. The social political structure included all three varieties, villages, cities, and small farms. Another difference is clearly noted in the human resources. Northern colonies or the New England's economy specialized in nautical or boating equipment, while later the region developed mills and factories. The environment is ideal for water-powered machinery mills, which allowed for finished products to be crafted, such as woven cloth and metal tools. The Middles colonies had rich farmland and a moderate climate. This made it a more suitable place to grow grain and livestock than New England. Their environment was ideal for small to large farms. The coastal lowland and bays provided harbors, thus the Middle colonies were able to provide trading opportunities where the three regions meet in market towns and cities. The southern colonies had fertile farmlands which contributed to the rise of cash crops such as rice, tobacco, and indigo. Plantations developed as nearly subsistent communities. Slavery allowed wealthy aristocrats and large landowners to cultivate huge tracts of land. As these regions developed highly specialized economies, each could not supply everything that was needed or at least not as effectively as an interdependent system, they relied on each other for certain items or skills. The contested North America. It should be noted that None of the European colonies could claim complete dominance of North America. The desire to expand and defend their current claims meant that the English, French, and Spanish colonies were drawn into regular conflict with one another. As well as with the Indians upon whose land they encroached. All sought control of the Native Americans and their land, their military power, their trade, and even their souls. Spanish missionaries and soldiers sought to convert Indians on the west coast and exploit their labor. French alliances with Indian tribes posed a formidable barrier to westward expansion of the British Empire. Yet despite their attempts to tame their New World holdings, Spanish and French colonists did not develop societies. They did not participate in the cultural, economic, social, and religious changes experienced by the British North America. Nor did they share in the emerging political identity of the British colonists. Identifiably colonial products from New England, the Middle Colonies, and the Southern Colonies flowed to the West Indies and across the Atlantic. Back came unquestionably British consumer goods along with fashions in ideas, faith, and politics. On the other hand, the bonds of the British Empire required colonists to think of themselves as British subjects. And, at the same time, encouraged them to consider their status as colonists. By 1750, British colonists in North America could not imagine that their distinctively dual identity, as British and as colonists, would soon become a source of intense conflict. 